Hello, BookTube. As you poor civilians will know, there have been rumbles recently of a return to hostilities in the OGBG Book Wars, the Old Geezer's Book Group Book Wars, in which a whole bunch of extremely inessential booktubers decided to risk life and limb and go out to use bookstores in an effort to one-up each other. Uh, we thought that we had seen the cessation of hostilities when Jason Harrigan, uh, who was the prime instigator in these things, uh, sort of backed away from BookTube for a bit. But recently, Mark Richardson has gone on one book haul after another up there in the snowy woods of Vermont. I felt compelled to uh, make a, a response myself. And just recently, he mentioned on uh, Instagram that he was planning a massive book haul in the future, another one. And one of the comments on that seemed to be from Jason Harrigan himself feeling tempted to return to the fray. So I thought it was only right that I do a kind of uh, night march. <laughs> and uh, so I went back to the Brattle Bookshop uh, today, which is a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston that is terrific. And it has such a high turnover rate that I, you actually can go back there on two consecutive days and find a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't find the first day or they didn't think about the first day. And I want to show them to you. And there's a theme running through some of these things. <laughs> there's a theme running through. You don't, you don't go to the battle looking for themes. If you do that, you won't find anything. But nevertheless, themes can crop up because it obviously a person who sells book on subject X to the Brattle can sell many books on subject X to the Brattle at the same time. They'll be packed up into the same box. They'll be put in the same corner of the basement. They might be brought up on the same uh, dolly and priced at the same time, which means you will sometimes see a batch of things. But you can't expect that, especially on the sale lot books outside, which are not arranged in any order. They're all random. If you go out there expecting something, you'll find nothing. It's, you, you, the time to appreciate a theme is once you're safely back home. <laughs> uh, but we'll get to the theme. First, I want to show you a couple of oldies but goodies here that I uh, was very happy to find. The first one being uh, a replacement. Uh, this is Noel and the Sackvilles by Vita Sackville West in, in a nice uh, hardcover. Uh, this, is, this is Vita Sackville West. Uh, <laughs> the, Sackvilles, the Sackvilles are all through this thing, uh, including on the back that is, uh, is a Sackville heir, a Sackville ancestor. Uh, Knoll is an enormous uh, country estate, just enormous, palatial estate. I've been over every inch of it, every attic, every cellar, uh, every every single foot of the deer parks that it's surrounded on all sides. I had a, a friend when I was spending time in England, I spent a, a bit of time in Leeds and traveled all over the country and I had a friend who was in a perfect position to get me entree to old houses and uh, and not the usual tourist kind. I took him up on that as often as I could, and Noel is a special case in a lot of ways. It is astonishing, just astonishing. Uh, and it's been in the family for centuries. There are still, I believe, Sackvilles that live there. Uh, it, it, it's almost as big as a village on its own, so you, there's plenty of room. You can have tours, even if you are just a tourist, if you ever have a chance to go to Knoll and walk around, take a guided tour of the place, you should do it. It's incredible. Uh, <laughs> that is Frida destroying things. Having a rather antic afternoon here that you can hear construction in the background. The construction work is ongoing on that three foot by three foot patch of ground directly outside my front door. Uh, that has been true since the 1890s and it will stay true forever. There are workers out there now who are showing there are old workers out there now who are showing their children who were conceived and born, raised, educated, and entered into the city service in the time that this particular job on that three foot by three foot patch has been going on. So their older relatives are now introducing them to the intricacies of jackhammering and backhoeing up a three foot by three foot patch of ground, staring at dirt for the whole of the day and then causing God's own amount of noise in order to put it all back in place. Put a gigantic five-ton metal plate over it for the night, put the plate over it ineptly so that the plate is uneven, meaning that every time a car or a bus or a truck touches the plate or runs over it, it's going to sound like an atom bomb going off. And then come back the next day, lift up the plate, and make God's own noise digging up that ground again. There are now two generations of people out there biological generations, not just, not just you know, you're X number of years older than the, your, your youngest co-worker, but the actual children 
taking over the position on that three foot by three foot patch of the workers who started it. Uh, so you're going to hear that, but there, at least the roofing noise is over with. Uh, but anyway, uh, getting back to Noel, uh, Vita Sackville West was the 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 oldest and in line to inherit this property, and couldn't do it only because she was female. And this this has caused that that very issue had caused problems in the past in the in the long history of the Sackvilles and the West uh, and the Cliffords people saying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what my gender is. This belongs to me. And Vita Sackville West naturally had a bit of a sore spot about that, about the fact that she couldn't live at Knoll, that she it wasn't hers. It couldn't be her home. She loved it. She loved the place. Uh, and part of why she had a sore spot about it was, as she told her friend and lover, Virginia Woolf, it, owning Knoll, having it in her possession, being having it be hers, would have, uh, as she put it, made her feel more uh, a part of history than just being a, a technical footnote in someone who was turned out of doors because she was the wrong gender. And Virginia Woolf did what great, a great, only a great novelist can do, and did her best to fix that by writing Orlando, by writing a story about the Sackvilles and about Vita Sackville West and about Noel. Uh, but it's not quite the same thing as being there, is it? And Vita Sackville West did the next best thing herself by writing an immortal book. Noel and the Sackvilles is a house biography of a type that, is, that has a long and illustrious history in British letters. And no offense to my beloved Elizabeth Bowen, who also wrote a great entry in that tradition, this is by far the best of them. An amazing, amazing book. Uh, that is, a, It's a guide to Noel, but it's also... A, very personal. I want to read you just a bit here. Uh, and I hope we'll show that. The galleries are perhaps the most characteristic rooms in such a house. Long and narrow with dark, shining floors, armorial glass in the windows, rich plasterwork ceilings, and portraits on the walls, they are splendidly somber and sumptuous. The color of the cartoon gallery, where I have come into it in the evening, with the sunset flaming through the west window, has often taken my breath away. I have stood stock still and, and astonished in the doorway. I have, uh, the gallery is 90 feet in length, the floor formed of black oak planks irregularly laid, the charm of which is that they are not planks at all, but solid tree trunks, split in half with the rounded half downwards. And on this oak flooring lie the blue and scarlet patches from the stained vest window, more subduedly echoed in the velvets of the chair coverings, the colored marble of the great Renaissance fireplace, and the fruits and garlands of the carved woodwork surrounding the windows. There is nothing garish. All the colors have melted into an old harmony that is one of the principal beauties of these rooms. The walls here in the cartoon gallery are hung with the rose-red velvet, rose-red Genoa velvet, so lovely that I almost regret the copies of the Raphael cartoons hiding most of it. But if, at Knoll, one were too nicely reluctant to sacrifice walls, whether paneled or velvet hung, then all the pictures would have to be stacked on the floor of the attic. The same regret applies to the ballroom, where the Elizabethan paneling, oak, but originally painted white, turned by age to ivory, is so covered up by the un, uh, by the, as to be unnoticeable behind the Sackville portraits of ten generations. You should see them. They line the galleries, one portrait after another. No space at all to contemplate them individually. They're just just a, a police gallery of sackbills. Uh, fortunately, the frieze in the ballroom cannot be hidden. It used to delight me as a child with its carved intricacies of mermaids and dolphins, mermen and mermaids with scaly, twisting tails and salient anatomy. And I was in, uh, invariably contemptuous of those visitors to whom I pointed out the frieze, but who were more interested in the pictures. It always fell to my lot to show the house to visitors when I was living there alone with my grandfather. And whenever a telegram arrived threatening invasion, he used to take the next train to London for the day, returning in the evening when the coast was clear. It mattered nothing that I was every bit as bored by the invasion as he could have been. In a divergence between the wishes of 80 and the wishes of 8, the wishes of 8 went to the wall. <laughs> And the, the book is full of an admixture there of glowing descriptions of the house and its history. There's some great history writing in here. Uh, and the personal, liberally mixed in in a very intentional way because Vita Sackville, knowing or unknowing me, wanted to underscore the fact that this place is hers. It's part of her life. 
is not just a beautiful place that she knows really well, like the like uh, stately home books often are. It was hers. It had it was it's entwined with her family history and her own history. I had a, I have a trade paperback of this that uh, because it has lots of full color insert paint uh, pictures had really crappy binding. I might still have it somewhere, but I remember the last time I tried to read it past page 30, it was crackling. And this won't do that. It's a nice a nice old hardcover, so I got that. And then this next one is something that I actually showed you on a Friday Reads. I showed you an ebook copy. Uh, and amazingly, I found, I found the original. And I so much, I don't so much mind that duplication right now, because we're still in 2020. My full uh, evolved and definitive stance on what I do with ebooks versus print books. Uh, well, I'll have to come to that in 2021. I'm certainly not going to make any major conceptual ideological distinctions this late in the year. So I got a hardcover copy of a book that I already have as an ebook. I'm not sure that that as a practice is going to survive in 2021 because 2020 was the year that I wholly gave myself over to ebooks. But nevertheless, it has survived so far, and only at the Brattle was I ever going to find a copy of this thing. We've already talked about it. It's this, A Sailor's Odyssey. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Vicar Cunningham, uh, known as uh, by his initials during the, during World War II as ABC. Uh, was a, This is just a gorgeous thing. Uh, that I, just, I just found it at the Brattle, this thing. This is from when? From the 1950s? Uh, 1951. <laughs> and that, that is our author. A prime fighting admiral of a kind that uh, is the pride and joy of English history. In fact, there's a blurb on the back here that is, from the Observer that is really, really good. Really good. Uh, the author of this book, enthralling as a narrative, invaluable as a historical document, is in the true line of descent of the fighting admirals who have shed luster on our naval annals. And then the reviewer ends with the simple line, he is not the least of them. And that's putting it mildly. He was... Uh, very active in combat during World War One, he remained active in tense eye-to-eye -eye confrontations with with live gun enemies during the interval between World War One and World War Two. And then in World War Two, he commanded the Mediterranean Fleet and was the organizing principal behind a number of actual turn-of-the-moment battles, not stately affair type things where he had a fifty thousand. Uh, you know, personnel or equipment advantage, but things that could easily have gone wrong and on which turned the wealth, the health and happiness of not only his nation, but tens of thousands of innocents. And he handled them well. He emerged as their victor. And he tells all those stories here in this book with a remarkable reserve. Just a remarkable, it's just a, a remarkable reserve of somebody who at a very young age in his career was accustomed to being obeyed and didn't let it get to his head. Uh, this uh, this author was, I mean, after he was commander of the fleet, he was also uh, first sea lord. He was uh, lord steward for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, which is a position that comes into being and is only used for coronation. So he is so far the last one in that line. There'll be another one in the 21st century, but he's the last one so far. And he retired with all honors to a, you know, to a country house. He and his wife kept up a, a vigorous social life. Uh, he stayed involved in issues involving the Admiralty, involving involving his old his old profession, and was buried at sea. Uh, and the the stories in here are just fantastic. They are such uh, live ammo stories about somebody who was right there at the heart of things. In addition to everything else, uh, this guy made history. ABC made history because he masterminded the first entirely aerial naval bombardment of a target before Pearl Harbor the, where where the, the role of the of the master of the vessel was to deliver the aircraft not to attack anything with his own guns uh, and I want I want to read you just a bit of uh, of here I, I, I opened it random to a passage uh, about a tough spot in Malta where where the uh, the harbor was completely mined in by the Germans uh, after we had been at, uh, a day at sea, the Vice Admiral Malta, that's how he, that's how he puts it, Vice Admiral Colin Malta, that identifies the man, the station identifies the man, reported that his harbors were completely mined in and that the destroyer flotilla there could not sail to join the convoy. 
All the sweepers that dealt with magnetic mines had also been lost or damaged. This was a sorry business, but having started, I was certainly not going to order our convoys from Malta back to Alexandria. So I sent for the fleet torpedo officer, a rather silent, imper imperturbable, and never defeated Commander W.P. Carn, and told him to do something about it. <laughs> Incidentally, we had uh, a corvette fitted out for magnetic mine sweeping, the, Glo the Gloxinia, with one of the convoys, though she could never be expected to deal with all the mines. However, in about an hour's time, Commander Carn reappeared with a long signal in which the Vice Admiral Malta was directed to blast the chant a channel into Malta with depth charges, of which, fortunately, there were plenty in store. I do not know if the procedure was strictly orthodox, but the basis of the idea was that a depth charge dropped ever so many yards would countermine or upset the firing mechanism of any magnetic mines in the vicinity of the explosion. The scheme was a triumphant success. Various mines were destroyed in the approaches and a swept channel buoyed. It has to be recorded, however, that when the Gloxinia towing her magnetic sweep, or fluffing her tail, as they called it, because that's what it kind of looked like, uh, led the convoy into the harbor next day, nearly a dozen more mines went up as she steamed through the breakwater entrance. Uh, when passing Benghazi, the Ajax and three destroyers were detached to shoot up the port during the night of May 7th to May 8th. They had great success, for after bombarding the harbor area, they later met a convoy of two merchant ships, one, carrying motor transports and ammunition, blew up, and the second ran ashore and was left well ablaze after several explosions. I afterwards heard lurid tales of motor lorries hurtling through the air right over the destroyers. <laughs> and uh, the whole book is like that. It is a marvelous combination of old seamen's tales and trustworthy first-hand histor historical accounts. And now, in addition to having an e-copy, because the brattle is the brattle, I now have a, a, a physical printed copy. Uh, but then we'll get to the uh, the theme, the theme that developed this time around, uh, which was adjacent to uh, late-night shirtless Skyping sessions that I've had with Bill Rutenberg of the Rutenberg Library. The, the manly men, he-men of our little corner of YouTube often Skype together. Uh, mainly to complain about how our, our lives and destinies are ruled by Olive and Britta, but also to compare notes on works of history, because we're all interested in various, ti in various time periods of history. Uh, and a lot of it is very interestingly uh, connected to regions, right? Uh, like, for instance, Mark Richardson is salt of the earth New England. He's, he's from Vermont, which considered Massachusetts to be in the Confederacy. <laughs> We're too far south. Uh, the classic Mark Richardson moment that I think I recorded in a video years ago where we were driving along the road there in Vermont. He knows every stone and tree and notch in every mountain. And we were talking about uh, a supply route over the White Mountains, I think it was. And he said, uh, he just offhand commented, oh, yeah, that, that supply route was important in both wars. <laughs> and a normal person sitting in the back seat would have said, oh, really? I didn't know Vermont saw any action in World War I and World War II. But those weren't the wars that he was talking about at all. He said thoroughly New England, but when he said both wars, and I guess it's a reflection on how, on how New England I am that I knew what he was talking about. I knew what he meant. Uh, but naturally, for someone like Mark, or to an extent for someone like me, the, the war that you're going to be interested in is the American Revolution. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I sometimes suspect that Mark's own interests lie even before the Revolution in the wars that were fought between England and Spain, or England and France, in the colonies before then. But one way or another, you, you become interested in the, in the topography that you're seeing around you. You become interested in the things that are more immediately resonant to where you are, I think, sometimes, if you're a history buff. Mark and I would concentrate on New England, so we would concentrate on the American Revolution. Whereas Bill Rutenberg over in Iowa, I think somewhat more naturally concentrates on the, um, the American Civil War. And if you've watched his channel, I'll leave a link to his channel and Mark's channel down below. I wish I could remember. I wish I could find the video where I, where I first told that anecdote about the, the, that, that route was important in both wars. <laughs> It's such a classic Mark moment. Because uh, we're, we're, everything in Vermont, you're, no matter what happens in Vermont, you're two centuries off. No matter what happens. So if somebody, if a Vermonter, especially one of long standing, tells you, oh yeah, that general store, that went up in, in 31. Your instinct as a normal person is going to be, oh, 1931, boy, that's pretty old, but you're off by two centuries. That's, that's not what a Vermonter means. Or when they say, oh yeah, that, oh, you know, this, this snowstorm's pretty bad. It's not, the same, it's not as bad as we had in 21. 
they're not talking about 1921 <laughs> at all. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, if you've watched Bill Rutenberg's channel, then you've seen that he has a lot of books on the American Civil War. And he's also asked me in shirtless Skype sessions late at night when, when Britta and Olive aren't listening, <laughs> he's also asked me what I think about some Civil War authors and Civil War series and whatnot. So when I came across a bunch of Civil War books at the Brattle today, I didn't resist, especially since they're all free. I'm working on a gigantic amount of store credit, so they're all, they're all, these things didn't cost me anything except the labor to get them back here because I don't have any muscular teenagers at the moment. I was lugging things back on my own. And you're going to see, that was no small thing in this particular case. First one I got is from, uh, I believe, the early 2000s. I don't think I've ever read this book. Uh, 2012. Okay, so I probably did. I probably did read this book. Uh, uh, but it, it's long since due for a reread, one way or another. And that is this book. It's Richard, excuse me, it's Richard Slotkin, The Long Road to Antietam, How a Civil War Became a Revolution. And it's a, it's a, a social study. It's a biographical study of all the main people involved, especially four people, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and... Uh, General McClellan, who was in charge of the army at the time. And one of the most explosive things that Slotkin gives time and attention to in this book is uh, McClellan's not half-formed, but fully formed intention to maybe try his hand at a military takeover of the United States to depose Abraham Lincoln. I, th that part is, is, is usually not stressed in writings about McClellan. But this is a story about all that, and it's woven around a fantastic account of Antietam, of the Battle of Antietam itself. There's, it just, just amazing. Just, just, uh, the account of Antietam is amazing here. There's, uh, what's the other one? The other great book on Antietam, A Landscape Turned Red? Is that it? Actually, Bill Rutenberg would probably know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't read, I don't dote as much on American Civil War w books as I should. Uh, so when I saw this, I grabbed it uh, as, as a reread. Maybe not as a keeper. Uh, the goal here is uh, at, at the battle at all times, but especially now that I have this new space to fill. And that, can I show it to you? That bookcase right there, that empty bookcase is for keepers mainly in 2021, but it's on my mind now. That is for books that I will keep. And when you go to a place like the Brattle, you're always hoping, even when the books are free, even when you're not, there's, there's no outlay, you're still always hoping that you're just going to get keepers. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe the maybe Slotkin's book will be a keeper. I don't know. I have a feeling that uh, these two will be. <laughs> but but uh, another one that I got is another one that Bill Rutenberg has brought up and that he has asked me about, a, one, a famous one-volume history of the Civil War. As soon as I saw it at the Brattle today, I realized I didn't have a copy. And also that it's been a long time since I read it. And you're gonna, all going to know this, Battle Cry of Freedom. Uh, this, this is taught in schools. It is at the top of any recommend list for a one-volume history of the Civil War time period. The battles, the people, and whatnot. Uh, and... Uh, it came up in an exchange with Bill Rutenberg at some point or other, fairly recently. It was maybe it's a Q&A or a comment on one of his videos. And uh, I liked it. I remember liking this volume, but uh, not loving it. And then I realized how long it's been since I read it. I haven't read this. I haven't given this a reread. I read this when it first came out, 1988. I read this when it first came out. So it's high time that I read it again, especially since one of the blurbs on the back is from Peter Prescott uh, from Newsweek. And I don't, you, you know, none of you are going to know his name, but if he liked a book, it had to go through a real gauntlet. He, he was a critic who told the truth at all times and did not fear. His paymasters, his editors, had given him the price, a, a pearl beyond price, a gift that is in every editor's gift, but that so few of them do, which is to tell him, write anything you want about anything, as savage as you want. There are no sacred cows. You don't need to please anyone we want you so write anything you want about anything which allowed peter prescott to savage things that all other critics were playing nice with and made him singularly refreshing to read and he loved this book and lots of other people did too and of course i liked it as well so uh i i saw a free copy and i will get it and uh, uh the reason one of the reasons that it came up what again I, I don't remember the exact the exact context of how this came up with bill rutenberg he might remember uh, better, even though he's significantly older than I am. His memory might be better. Uh, but one way or another, in the course of that brief exchange, I mentioned that a lot of the best writing about the American Civil War has been done by books in series. They actually make out one behind me. There's Shelby Foote's trilogy in a box set. 
right behind me on the nightstand. And of course, Bruce, Cat Bruce Catton, my favorite American historian about the American Civil War, wrote many, many volumes on the American Civil War. He wrote a one volume thing to stand alone, this hallowed ground, but he also wrote books and series. And in the 20th century, no book in series about the American Civil War was more famous than Alan Nevin's series on the American Civil War. He won a Pulitzer Prize for the first book, The Ordeal of Union, and every subsequent book that came out was a huge cause for critical uproar and hosannas of praise and whatnot. Uh, I think The Ordeal of Union was his second Pulitzer Prize. He was a, a journalist for a long, long time, and that you can definitely see that in his writing. But uh, I subsequently fell so much in love with Bruce Catton's trilogy on the American Civil War, and even with Shelby Foote. Shelby Foote's uh, trilogy there in the box set is beautifully written. Just beautifully written. I fell so much in love with those things uh, that I started to think of, of Nevin's series as not only overlong, which obviously it is, but also uh, a little dull, a little on the dry side. And having it come back up again in, in an exchange with, with Bill Rutenberg made me realize how long it's been since I gave it another try, since I looked at it again. And that's not fair. There were plenty of readers at the time that those books were coming out who would have called down Hellfire on a boring series, and they did not. They loved it. Uh, and so I thought I would give it another try. And you're probably thinking, if you're not familiar with the Brattle, you're probably thinking, oh, what, did you find a nice battered paperback copy of the ordeal of union you're going to try you're going to try the first book and get the old scent back no nope. <laughs> no nope, because it's the prattle i found them all <laughs> i found this reissue of the whole set two uh, two books in each book eight books total <laughs> so, so this i have bill rutenberg to thank for this i will be i'm going to be doing a huge amount of rereading in the last part of this year and this is on the list i will be rereading these in 2020 or at least starting them. And if I don't get to them, I will be rereading them in 2021. So thanks a lot. <laughs> and this is a half a shelf on the keeper list if I, if I actually do keep them. We'll see. I could be in for a real a pleasant surprise. I could really like these things. Uh, like, for instance, let me read you uh, a bit of uh, the, the very first, the very beginning of Volume 1 uh, of The Ordeal of Union. This just goes on uh, from here. It goes on like this. And... Uh, Nevins very wisely starts long before the Civil War. In fact, he starts with the Mexican-American War, where almost all of the Marquis generals on, the, on North or South got their blooding and learned their craft, uh, especially at the fall of Chapultepec, uh, and will, uh, which gets such a pride of place in a novel called For the Love of Robert E. Lee that I just love so much that's out of print. But uh, anyway... The first chapter here is called The Hour of Victory. Let me read you just a bit so you get a sense for what this is like. Of course, the star of the show will be the laughingstock of the American Civil War, Winifield Scott, the General Winifield Scott, who was not a laughingstock at the time we're talking about. He was, effectively, the single conqueror of Mexico. <laughs> uh, and that, that is an amazing thing. If you look at his record, his military record, on the ground in Mexico, it's unbelievable. It bears, it bears comparison with any general in subsequent decades or centuries, including General Patton. Uh, it, it, impossible to remember that now, because he was a subject of mockery in the American Civil War, old fuss and feathers, and a different breed of general was taking over, people that he had commanded in Mexico. Uh, but anyway, we'll start with him. Let me give you a sense of what Nevins is like, in case you want to undergo this yourself. <laughs> Not all of you will have access, such easy access as a great bookstore as The Brattle, where all these things are free. Uh, but... Uh, well, they aren't free, I should, I should stress. These would have cost you money. I had store credit. But you know what I mean. A, a normal small-town used bookstore will never see a set of these, or might see one volume. Uh, but anyway. Uh, on the high Mexican plateau, in se the September nights are chill. The first gray glimmer of day was appearing outside Winifield Scott's headquarters on the craggy height of Tacubaya, less than a mile from Chapultepec on its sister hill, when the sentry's challenges rang out to halt a group ascending the slope. An orderly roused the general. It was a deputation from the Municipal Council of Mexico City, he reported, passing through from Worth's command under the escort of Major W. W. McCall. A few minutes later, the councillors, facing the tall, heavily built general, were pouring out their voluble information. Santa Ana and other leaders had stolen away from the capital at midnight. The remaining Mexican forces, leaderless and disheartened, 
wanted no more fighting. The people were eager for peace. The councillors had come to capitulate in form. Relief stole over Scott's heavily lined countenance, even as he shook his head. The afternoon before, Quitman and Worth had fought their way inside the city walls. Some of Worth's officers, Raphael Semmes and a lieutenant of the 4th Infantry named U.S. Grant, were especially mentioned, uh, had performed gallant exploits. The intrepid Quitman, with his tall frame, stiff graying hair, and keen eyes, had seen South Carolina's palmetto flag go up as the first American banner over Mexico City. As darkness fell, with Santa Ana still holding the citadel, everybody had looked forward to another day of carnage, and Scott now rejoiced to learn that the fighting was over, but he told the councils that he would sign no capitulation, that the city would all, was already virtually in American possession, and that his army would enter it under no terms not self-imposed. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's as good as anything you're going to find in Shelby Foot or, or Bruce Catton. So maybe Bill Rutenberg, maybe I, this was a good thing. And this is a perfect example. I, I'll end with this. This is a perfect example of what I talk about, the serendipity of this bookish community on BookTube, which is that somebody can talk about something, mention something on a video, in a comment, as an aside, not at all mention, meaning to urge it on you or recommend it to you, and suddenly a penny drops in your head and you think... Oh my, okay, this is off the beaten path from what that person was talking about. But I need to go back to this myself. I do. I, they're not telling me to, but I need to do this myself. That happens to me all the time. Sean Stanfast's channel, back when he was making BookTube channels, I hope he comes back. I hope he, I'll just say it officially, I hope he and Jason Harrigan both come back to BookTube. Uh, but when he was doing that, or Jason himself, or Peg, the History Channel, how uh, the History Shelf, how many books did they hold up? Without meaning to stress anything at all, without meaning to urge it on anybody, that made me think, I have to get that. Uh, and this is an example of that. This is the, the, the chaos that Bill Rutenberg hath wrought. So that was our trip to the Brattle today in a military sortie designed to keep my side from losing <laughs> in the OGBG book war that appears to be creeping back into live fire. Uh, so we have Alan Nevins, the whole of Alan Nevins. So we have Long Road to Antietam uh, by Richard Slotkin. Uh, we have Battle Cry of Freedom uh, by McPherson. This is uh, uh, the, the standard one-volume work on the American Civil War. And then two oldies but goodies. We have The Sailor's Odyssey by ABC. And we have Noel and the Sackvilles by Vita Sackville West. Her masterpiece. And also one of the, one of the great uh, house books in British letters. So there you go. That is, that is our Brattle Hall for today. And who knows what tomorrow will bring. More hostilities? And, and to think, no matter how many guns are fired in Vermont or on the west coast of Ireland or from Sean Stanfast's book-lined little corner, no matter how many guns are fired, the only casualties are going to be your TBRs. <laughs> War is cruel. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.